Most string players learn intonation primarily by its linear function and focus on making the single melodic line to be really in tune with itself. However, when it comes to playing double stops or with an ensemble, it's really important to realize that the whole concept of intonation has to become more flexible and it might have to undergo some changes in order to make the harmony in tune. Hey, this is Ina Langerman from Violina.Live, helping you along your musical journey. In this video, we're going to take a look at the interplay between the Pythagorean and just intonation systems through five different examples in the standard repertory. Many times string players have to switch between the two systems within the same piece and sometimes the two clash making it seemingly impossible to play something 100% in tune. If you're not familiar with the Pythagorean or just intonation systems I strongly recommend that you first check out this video right over here where I give a brief overview what this is all about. Now it was very difficult for me to just pick five examples because there are so much music out there so if you have some really great examples please put those down in the comments below and maybe I'll make another video about this using your examples. Number five is Bach's Adagio in G minor the very opening of his first solo sonata. I chose this to start off with because it's such a great demonstration of the two tuning systems within the same phrase right from the very start and we're going to pay attention to the note B flat. <laughs> So right at the very beginning, we want to have the G minor chord to be really in tune. So the third note, B flat, it has to be placed slightly higher than you normally would in the Pythagorean system. So we have to make this major sixth interval really in tune, the B flat to the G. Now the G has to be, of course, in tune with this. So this is non-negotiable. The B flat, we want it to ring. In the Pythagorean system, however, we would place the B flat a little bit lower because it would be a half step with the open A. If we were to play the scale in single notes, here's what happens. We play this chord. What happens if we do not move this B flat? You see, it's much too sharp to be in tune with the linear melody coming down. So when we come down, it's very important that we change this B flat a little bit lower. So we do like this. I hope you can see. Right here. Like that. So we have to make it a little lower. Now, if you can notice... This lower B flat is no longer in tune with that major six that I played in the very beginning. So this is a great example of switching between the two systems in a single phrase right from the very start. Number four, we're going to take a look at Mozart's fourth string quartet in C major. Let's just take a look at the first four measures. So first violin part. <laughs> Our second violin part, two thirds, and viola we have. And then cello we have just five and one. So it's really just one, five. Five, one. If you took uh, these four measures and you simplified them to its harmonies, it would be so simple. So because of that, just intonation system should really be important here, especially because the first and second violin parts are in thirds. They should really be in tune with each other. So here's the interesting thing. In the first violin part, in measure four, the note F. Now, this should be a perfect fourth interval above C. In order to make the melody in tune, the F and the E should really be close to each other. But if I'm making this a perfect fourth and I want the E to be in tune with the melody, I would have to place the E a little bit higher and it would no longer be in tune 
with the chord, but I said earlier, hey, I want that chord to be really in tune. This is where it gets interesting. Usually when a string quartet tunes, they'll prioritize those perfect intervals because if they're out of tune, you can really hear they're out of tune. But if we take a look at the history of music theory, there was a time when the perfect fourth interval was considered a dissonance, specifically whenever you would have a 4-3 suspension. And I think this is an example of one of those. The F is a non-chord tone in this example. People are going to have different opinions about this, but because it's a non-chord tone, I think this is where we might be able to make an exception when it comes to tuning perfect intervals. I might get some backlash for saying this, um, because we always want those perfect intervals in tune, right? But here, the F is just a suspension. So I think one solution for this is keep that E in tune with the C major chord, and make a narrow F natural above it to really show that voice leading. Of course, if the F was part of the harmony, that would be a totally different story. But this is what I think. Um, maybe I'll change my opinion in the future. What do you think? Let me know. Coming in number three, Beethoven's 12th string quartet, opus 127. We're going to take a look at the first movement, skip to measure 135, which is where it switches to the key of C major and we have a big C major chord. We have a big problem here because normally the strings, they tune to perfect fifths, right? So what happens is in the Pythagorean system, when you have pure fifths tuned one on top of each other, by the time you get to a certain point, they get sharper and sharper. So what happens is if we tune our stringed instruments the way we normally do, the C in the cello will no longer be in tune with the open E on the violin. So the E would actually be very sharp to that C. We have a C major chord and if you take a look at the second violin part in uh, measure 136, we have this chord in the second violin part and it has the open E string. You can't cover it because you have all four strings being used. The problem is that open E would be out of tune with the cello, with the rest of the chord. Let's take the note G, which is the fifth. I cannot move it because I have open G here. I'll tune my C so it's a perfect interval to the G. Okay, so this is a non-negotiable. Those are perfect intervals of the C major chord. I can't change those. So now the E, I want to tune it to just intonation system for the chord to be really in tune. But now, of course, I cannot move the C. Look what happens with the open E. You hear? It's really out of tune. My open E is just slightly too sharp. What many string quartets do in such a situation is they will tune their open strings slightly narrower. They won't make them into pure fifths because they know they're going to encounter such a problem. I think it also depends on what piece they are playing. So if they're playing something in D major, it's not so problematic. But in a piece like this, where they know they're going to have something like this going on, they will really tune those fifths just slightly narrower. So the C strings will be slightly higher and the open E would be just very slightly lower and they would check that the low C and the open E they can tune with each other. I'm actually going to put two recordings into the description below. The Talik Quartet, the Czech Quartet, and compare it with the Emerson and just compare the two intonations of these two quartets here. Number two is Schubert's Fifth Symphony, Second Movement. We're going to take a look at measure 24 in the second movement after the repeat sign. Schubert makes one of his unexpected modulations. He's so famous for that. He goes from E flat major to C flat major. Very unrelated. So. so I actually put this on this list not so much because there is much of a conflict in decision making, but really just because two things. First of all, we have a bigger ensemble here um, and also very important is how to place the first note of this measure. We have an F flat and we have uh, in the first violin part and in the flute actually. Here. 
he goes here. Now, I'm not going to play all the parts here, but you can go listen to really understand what's going on here. The challenging part here is how to place that first note between all the instruments, because it's doubled in the bass, cello, first, second violin, in the flute, in the oboe. The thing to pay attention to is the fact that the E flat, which was the tonic before in E flat major, it's now the third of the chord. If we take a look at the first violin part, it does have an F flat. That. Technically, it's enharmonic with the open E. Depending on how the ensemble places the chords leading up to this um, key change, that F flat may or may not be in tune with the E. So when you're playing in an orchestra, really listen to the whole group sound here. It's very important when you have modulations like this. Number one, Bach and Dante from the second sonata. I think this is the most difficult one from this list because I have never heard it played in tune 100% and I don't think it's possible. Let's take a look. Oh, we're back in C major. <laughs> So here's what's going on. If we are in C major, the note C has to be C. We cannot play around with it. We mentioned before, perfect intervals, we have to tune them. And we do not have a string quartet here. You know, this is a solo piece. So C and F have to be in tune. The real big challenge here is that we have the melodic line on top that really needs to be emphasized. So remember, to tune melodic lines, we need to use Pythagorean system, in which case the E and F would be close to each other. Because if we played a scale... However, in order to make the major third and tune the very, very opening of this... We would have to place the E a little bit lower to make that major third really, really in tune. However, if we place this in tune and we also place this F in tune what happens? the E and the F no longer are in tune with each other as a melody now we can't do that because uh, the melody needs to be in tune we have to show these two voices this is one of the biggest challenges of intonation I've ever encountered and I'll be honest Every time I listen to a recording of it, I never hear it 100% in tune because I don't think it's a totally possible. If we make that E higher in Pythagorean completely and keep that perfect fourth in tune, that's really out of tune. We don't want to start a piece like this. Usually what many violinists will do is really just place that E somewhere in between those two, kind of make the best of the situation. So my E would probably be closer to equal temperament, actually. I mean, I don't know exactly, but I try to place it in such a way that the third doesn't sound too jarring. It's not going to be completely pure, but that perfect fourth needs to be there. That's just my thought about this. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below what your thoughts are about tuning these pieces. And also let me know any other musical examples you have that really stand out for you when it comes to intonation. Okay, so thank you so much for watching this video. And if you found it useful, please share it with a friend or a colleague. Sign up for my bi-monthly newsletter. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Hit the notification bell. I upload every Friday at 11 Eastern. Until next Next week, happy practicing!